evening everyone. Half Beard the Space Pirate here to answer questions I forced you to ask me at gunpoint. Uh, this is the over a thousand subscriber thing because I thought this would be fun. You'll ask me very technical questions, what the heck. I, I'm fine. Oh, and so for a quick update, the script for Criticizing Starship Part 3 is at 75% completion and it's 26 pages long. This video is going to be over an hour long, end me. Uh, also, if you asked about Starship, I'm sorry, you're not going to get a very good answer until December. I'll, I'll just get going. So, Pep Metz asks about uh, the launch pad turnaround times. That's his big contention. He wrote a big paragraph on it. It should be somewhere over here. So, the answer to this question is, I don't know. This is an engineering problem. I don't think anyone's ever done a like a, a rapid turnaround of a launch pad. The only time I can think it would be for DCX, but that was very, very simple. Uh, not sure. You could probably design one that could take a few launches before needing some serious repairs, especially if it's something like Starship, which is relatively like low damage compared to like a Titan IV or like SLS would do because it's you know, big solid. So for this, I'm not sure. It's an engineering problem. Also, I'm going to pronounce everyone's names wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, Iris Failsafe asks if I have any jokes on Elon talking about a, a VTOL hypersonic plane. There's nothing really funny about that because people actually believe him. Sammy K, who has a very cute kitty in her profile picture, asks why my hair appears to be shorter or longer whenever I switch characters and videos. Uh, my head's lopsided, the lighting changes, and I, I do this. If you're thinking of no billionaires aren't going to Mars, that was intentional. The long hair, that was before I got a haircut, the first haircut in like six months I'd had, and uh, because I wanted to be a long-haired college student that you don't like. So, Leaky Cheese asks, what realistic exploration achievement would you like, most like to see happen in the next 10 years and why? Moon landing. That's the exciting one. I want to see that. Oh, K.R. Mayahara asks five really detailed questions. And I'm sorry, <laughs> they'll be very short. So the first one is about storage of LOX methane in space and then propellant transfer for it. So for the first part, LOX methane is relatively easy to store in space. They're at roughly the same temperatures. It's like 100K, 70 to 100K. It's not that bad, it's not that power hungry, especially compared to liquid hydrogen. You still have to put like cryo coolers and insulation on your spacecraft, but it's, it's a lot easier to manage than hydrogen. I did a design study where we transported 70 tons of liquid argon from low Earth orbit to the moon, and most of the power requirements were just for the ion thrusters that would take like two and a half years to get up there. So storage isn't necessarily that big of a problem. It's still, you still need to do it. Uh, then for uh, transfer of propellant. For that, it's you have to do it. It's never been done before. It's a, that needs to be proven. It's been done on the ground, but you need to do it in space. And then, again, for cryogens, the problem is the fact that they're cryogens. Uh, then the second one, how do I reconcile Elon Musk's success with the fact that Tesla is, you know, how is he successful when he says dumb things? And it's, the answer is really complicated and long. I, I, I'll put it this way. Elon is a byproduct of our times. That's the way I'll say it. Uh, he's got really good at hype. His stuff kind of works, right? Teslas do work. Rockets can land. It's not, it's not magic. It's not like Theranos, where Theranos obviously wouldn't work. These do work. It's just a question of economic feasibility. And of course, Teslas are Teslas. So they kind of work. He's also tapped into nerds and how they behave and their kind of semi-obsessive behavior, as well as kind of turning his ideas into a sort of lifestyle brand. There's a specific phrase to describe Elon that I'll talk about in criticizing Starship Part 3, so you'll have to wait for that part. And for 3, when, he's talk when Elon was interviewed by Everyday Astronaut, he's talking about how Starship blew up on the, the risk list. Uh, does that sound normal? I'm not sure because I didn't watch that, and Elon's also a PR person. We have to remember, he wants you to see him a certain way. So he's gonna say these things, he's a salesman, right? He's, yeah. Uh, so I would assume if it's referring to 
the Starship's crashing and exploding. It's hard to say. I don't know. I don't have access to their internal documents. Uh, so Elon, Elon probably doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, he's, again, he's, okay, I'm going to be stereotyping here. He's your average Redditor who read an article on Wikipedia once and thinks he knows everything. I would know. I was one of those people once. Four, uh, talking about, asking about like the, the flames and the excess gases. I'm assuming that's part of test procedure. You also have to remember in this scenario, Starship is being tested on the ground and static fired. So it's going to have buildup of stuff and gases that are going to burn along the side. I think that's just part of testing. I, I think it's fine. I hope. And then five, what about landing something's big and tall and skinny on Starship on the moon or Mars? Uh, potential problems? I mean, the center of gravity issues along with steering and controls, but that's just for any lunar lander. The real problem with this is Starship is tall and all the important bits are up top over the ground, right? You either need a really long ladder or an elevator or jet packs to get up and down. And that's just falling hazard, being stuck on the ground hazard. You could make a lander out of Starship, just not the way it is now. Naraxia asks on the feasibility of building a base slash colonizing the moon. So for colonizing, I don't know. I think there's very little economic drivers for most solar system colonization at this point. But for building a base, moon would be way easier than Mars. We almost did that in the 70s. There were so many studies. It's just a lack of political will to make it happen. It's way easier because the moon's closer. We've already landed on the moon. If something goes wrong, your abort capabilities are just burn and go home. The moon is you know, only a few days away compared to months. So you know, it'd also be good for testing out going to Mars because it's more like building like the operational know-how. How do people behave while on a, you know, a world, but not so far away that if anything goes wrong, they can't come back. So the moon's way better, or at least a better test bed for Mars than just going there. Trevor Phillips asks, since he's a former Huntsvillian uh, who went to UAH, hey, I go to UAH, uh, if I liked uh, Huntsville, Yes, I am from Minnesota, so it's, it's different because the weather is warmer, longer. And I think it snowed once already this year and everyone freaked out. I haven't really gotten much of a chance to go around Huntsville because of the pandemic, but I did go to G's Country Kitchen, and that was pretty good. So I like it so far. Uh, Ryan Raleigh asks, what are the challenges obstacles way of reliable on-orbit refueling, and then what's the best propellant to do it? Yeah, uh, so right now for methods like what SpaceX is planning, like transfer of cryogens has never been done before, except maybe in mock-up experiments. It just got to build it and do it and see what goes wrong. We're at that point, the TRL of propellant refueling is, at least the case of what we're talking about, is somewhere around five or six. It just needs to fly and be proven. And then the best propellants, of course, are storables because you don't have to worry about vapor ingestion. So these need to be done. Book recommendations for learning more about launch vehicle design and orbital mechanics. Oh crap, I don't have them with me. Uh, rocket propulsion elements, design a uh, modern design of liquid propulsion engines, orbital mechanics for engineers, uh, space mission analysis and design. And the other thing I would recommend is just reading technical reports, right? Like orbital mechanics, there's some really good stuff on low thrust transfers by Bob Farquhar, if I pronounced his name correctly. Uh, just read just read as much as you can and everything you can. And those books I said, don't obviously buy them all at once. They're all really expensive because they're college textbooks. Oh, and uh, someone asked where I got the pith helmet. I got this when I was in high school at Fleet Farm in the military surplus section. I finally got a chance to use it. So that's fun. Where am I gonna put this? Okay, so Philippe Gutierrez. Again, I'm gonna mispronounce everyone's name here, including my own. Uh, so, because quick question, so, yes, and yes, I am not objecting on Starship's technical feasibility. Most, it's not necessarily the economics either, to a certain degree. Mostly it's the fact that people put a lot of weird, like, connotations to it. They treat it very weirdly than, you know, other rockets. I have, I don't think Rocket Lab's Electron is going to save humanity the way people think Starship will save humanity. So that's, that's kind of weird. So, so what technical breakthroughs SpaceX needs to develop successfully for Starship to make economic sense? It's not necessarily SpaceX that has to do this. It's the fact that no one's launching anything beyond what we do in our current launch market. Now, I've heard about like Orbital Reef and those other space stations, but that's just not enough. 
The big problem is we're not doing much in space, more than what we do now, mega constellations notwithstanding. But I'll get to that in part three. And then, so is reusability the holy grail? Not necessarily. If we're talking about a society where we have to launch every day, multiple times a day, then we'll probably see more reusable systems or ultra expendable, wink. Uh, if so, what technical challenge is SpaceX facing? They're making it work. Uh, again, it's, it's launch rate, la lack of launch market, that's the real problem. Part three, we'll talk about this. Rigor Mortis 81 uh, asks, has there been any recent developments in life support or other systems that you have found interesting or dare I say promising? I don't follow life support systems, so uh, I just, I kind of follow through things. Mostly it's, uh, yeah, so sorry, I don't know much about them. People like meatware, ew, combustion, that's exciting. Uh, so why is, in, in your opinion, that this essential area isn't communicated better to the general public? It's not interesting. That's why. No one's, no one's really interested about, you know, maintaining biomass or supercritical water oxidizers or, you know, poop. Right? It's, it's life support. Ew. That's what we pulled grandma off last week. So, it's one of the most difficult problems to solve. It's not as exciting. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah you'd think you'd get more attention, but it's all weird nerd stuff. So, oh gosh. Blas Javorsi. What do I think about the Chinese space program, especially their rockets? Aside from the part that they land on people's villages, which, I mean, hey, you guys are paying for them. You might as well get them, you know? It's a really neat system they have by using a common, like, almost modular design, where they use basically the same first stage, and they just strap boosters to it, or they had different upper stages. It's actually quite brilliant. So it's, it's neat. Yeah, modularity is one of the keys to low-cost space access, if you were to ask me. So, I'm a rock hot Manson asks two questions. One, how much do you expect Starship to cost per launch? You're going to have to wait on that one. Two, when do you think humans will reach Mars and how? So for when, I think the earliest sa NASA says is about the late 2030s. So if there's political will, that's the key factor there, mid-2040s. It's probably a realistic goal. The architecture will probably be Mars semi-direct. So you probably have one reusable spacecraft that goes from low Earth orbit to Mars and back that'll carry the crew. Then you'll have a Mars lander that is sent, you know, two years ahead, refuel and come back, or at least up to the deep space transport. I'm going based off the deep space transport architecture I worked with back in 2017. So I'm assuming it's to be something like that. Uh, John asks, what's your opinion on Vulcan's smart engine reuse system? It's pretty smart. I'd like to see it happen. It's neat. Uh, the economics seem really sound, so. You need. Damien Druart asks three questions. What is your name? Paul. What is your quest? To revive Otreg but not get Jer Jerry Bold. And then, what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? European. That is a good question, isn't it? YouTube Vanced asks, question, can aluminum be used for a rocket engine if it is cooled like SSME? That's a technical question. And those books I brought up earlier, those will help you. Uh, so it's regeneratively cooled. I'm not sure. That's an actual technical problem. A big Plans Little Drive asks, how long has Thunderfoot been an inspiration for you? And now that you're in his YouTube lane, are you envious of the thought, or anxious of the thought, never meet your idols? I wonder if it wasn't the inspiration for what I was doing, actually. I hadn't watched him until I discovered, until I discovered he'd found G. Schwann and Sebastian. Uh, it's mostly like Simon Dan logic and like conspiracy theorist debunkers. That was what really inspired me. Again, my first real video was debunking Jaronism poorly. I mean, those videos suck. Don't watch them. But yeah, the plan was eventually to get on the non sequitur show. That didn't happen for obvious reasons, if you follow that. Because I remember distinctly what made me want to make the channel was they were arguing about the lunar module, and I was screaming at them, no, that's wrong! So, yeah. Uh, I would like to talk to Thunderfoot, though. That'd be interesting. Because I did watch some of this really old atheist content from, like, you know, 2011. So, yeah. Steve Kra asks four questions. One, what is the theoretical limit on how big we can make rockets? I think the Boeing AMLLV capped out at 5 million pounds to LEO. So I'm gonna guess that's about the limit. 
So somewhere, yeah, so maybe a thousand tons to Leo is probably what we're going to cap out at. Because if, if you're launching a thousand tons, what are you launching that you can't build on the moon? Right? It's, yeah. Two, why space imported? I'm assuming important to you. Well, I like it. It's neat. It's kind of a weird, just kind of clicks with me, you know? I just think it's neat. Four, is art and space important? Yes, especially long term. Uh, you listen to William Shatner speak after this Blue Origin flight. You know, to quote Contact, they shouldn't, have, they should have sent, shouldn't, yeah, they should have sent a poet. So it's eventually, if we're going to start seeing humans in space longer term, they're going to need to express themselves. I do not want to end up living on a moon base that looks like the inside of an aircraft carrier. I want it to be a place that's a warm home and, you know, place to live. Three, what is love? Good question. Ujal Mehdi asks, what inspired you to get an aerospace engineering degree? Uh... My dad's an engineer, so I was doomed from the start, but he's electrical engineering, you know, which is witchcraft and worship of the devil, so I couldn't do that. I just, I like airplanes and I like rockets, and I said, oh, guess I'll do that then. Uh, Bill asks, have you ever been to a rocket launch yourself? I have not yet. Will you go to Florida to watch SL launch, launch personally? Not Artemis 1, but maybe Artemis 2. I'm going to try to live stream Artemis 1 if I can. Space Flight Guru asks, what concept rocket are you most disappointed failed? Otrag! and Beal Aerospace, uh, the BA-2. I'll explain why in that Know Your Rocket. Sansic asks, that girl who pinged you during the last Kerbal Play session, did she appreciate your pencil protector? I was re specifically referring to pintle injector. As like a, right, because if you look at combustion chambers for normal rockets, the tops look like a shower head, but a pintle injector, which is what the uh, lunar module descent engine and SpaceX uh, Merlin engines use is a pintle injector. So it looks more like a, like a garden hose nozzle. It looks more like, you know, like this. I'm a very dirty person. And no, she never replied. Uh, Steve Craw again asks, know any good non-rocket launch systems? Not personally. I've heard of space elevators, but you'd still need a rocket to push the spacecraft into the proper orbit. You pretty much, until we figure out how to manipulate the universe, we'll be using some form of momentum transfer. So Orion nuclear pulse propulsion. I mean, that's cool. JP asks, are those Shuron eyeglass frames? Uh, these are Hemingway. Yeah, the glasses I wore in the space guns video, the, the round ones, I wore those throughout college. What is wrong with me? Uh, hyphen underscore hyphen asks, quick question, I'm no expert, but what are pressure fit engines mostly popular being good at and how often people use it in rocketry? So, pressure feds are probably the most commonly used engine in space uh, because they're very simple. Pressure tank, oxidizer tank, fuel tank, and then they have pretty much three moving parts, the valves. Right? They're very simple, very reliable, though lower performance, but they're reliable. There's less moving parts, right? Pressure fed, pressure fed, pressure fed with a bunch of thrusters. It's, they're really simple, right? Pumps are expensive, pumps are hard, uh, and they're finicky things, right? Less, less moving parts, theoretically the safer, so that's why. Oh, and sorry about the lighting. I forgot about daylight savings time. It's 4.45 right now, and it's really dark. Sorry if it doesn't look good. Okay, Stink Pickle 4000 that's a name, asks, what question do you want to be asked the most? Uh, I don't know. That's a, that's a good one. Jonathan Tome, Tome, I can't pronounce names, I'm sorry. What's your favorite Lovecraft story? Well, obviously, the horror at Red Hook. That, that, that's a joke. It's at the Mountains of Madness. Yeah. Nicholas Boyarko asks, looking good with a beard, why shave it off? What do you mean? It's right here. I don't think I look good with a beard. Because look, I mean, that's, that's why I call myself half beard, because this is about all I can do. Uh, why not always opt for RTG power sources on spacecraft? Uh, I, because I'm a loser nerd who tries to play Kerbal Space Program like a real space program would. I do build spacecraft with RTGs when I do Kerbal on my own, so. Are you curr uh, currently contract with your employer? When do you plan on buying a permanent residence? This is my permanent residence. I bought this. This is, this is my house until whenever. Uh, and for... For the record, I'm, I work for a military contractor, so I'm, I'm part of the military co industrial complex, so uh, I'm going to be there until, I don't know, the army stops using the redacted I work on, which isn't going to be anytime soon. 
If God were a hamburger, would he have cheese upon him? Why or why not? Or I have a strange feeling this is one of those internet debates I missed out on or was participating in like five years ago. Uh, well, if it's a hamburger that he wouldn't have cheese on him, that'd be a cheeseburger. So, I don't think so. But then again, wouldn't God manifest himself or themselves or herself, you know, pronouns in the bio, uh, in the way that the believer would want? Who knows? Potentially underscore great asks two questions. One, when are you making OTRAG 2.0 electric boogaloo? I don't like the tone of that, but when I hit 30,000 subscribers, or more realistically, in like five years, when I start building or building up to that, I'll let you know. Two, when are you making a Know Your Rocket on Delta Clipper? After I make one on Venture Star. So 2023 to 2024 ish. Know your rocket's gonna take me like 30 years at the way at the rate I'm going, so. <laughs> okay, face of sarcasm. Who invented the first rocket? Obviously, our Lord and Savior Elon Musk, or the Chinese. I'm guessing the Chinese. They invented everything. Okay, Lo or Io asks, could Iraq actually build a space gun? Theoretically, the CIA report I read suggested that they were having that SRC was having trouble with the Babylon gun but I don't know, bull's dead. Uh, could a country with no space program achieve this? Depends on their industrial capacity and how much their neighbors hate them. Because they, all they need the, to do is build a 16 inch naval gun, make it long enough to be basically a clone of HARP. Then you'd need the ability to make nitrocellulose propellant, the facilities to formulate and cast solid rocket propellants, and then electronics manufacturing capacity, specifically for the guidance systems like sun sensors. So I guess if they can do that, they can build a space gun, working one, uh, assuming their neighbors don't, you know, invade them for it, right? Or, you know, there's no oil there. Uh, does a space gun make a big boom sound? Yes, it does. How loud is, uh, I, don't, I don't remember, I used to know. We gotta remember that Babylon's recoil force was, I think, 27,000 metric tons. So, really loud, as in your ears will bleed and you'll die. So, I hope the rest of the Space Guns video answered your questions. Zagor asks, how do you think Starship and SLS will progress going into the future? You'll have to wait for part three on Starship, but for SLS, uh, I know the OIG report came out today. I haven't read it yet, so don't ask about that part, but I did hear about the RFI. NASA does seem interested in using SLS, obviously, at least until 2050, which I think would be a reasonable and intelligent option. You have the hardware, use it. Uh, and how do you think the future of SLS and NASA will pan out? For, for example, Gateway and Lunar Outpost, I think this will affect the future of space travel. Not sure about the, the future of space travel, because again, that depends on Congress. I mean, same with NASA. Depends on what Congress and uh, you know, the public wants. It's a public space program, so we're still subject to the whims of what the public wants. Uh, what I'd like to see would be SLS used for deep space missions and missions to like outer solar system bodies, right? The ice giants, Saturn, maybe Pluto or, you know, Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, and then for like a lunar base or hardware, you know, use SLS to launch cargo and crew to the moon. That's what it's meant to do. Let it do that. V, comma, Roche asks, what do you think of Arca? Oh, they're fun. I don't take them too seriously, but it's kind of neat to see if they make it work. Stikra, again, uh, asks, is there any infrastructure we could build that would lower the cost of launch? So the answer to this is not really infrastructure unless you're building stuff in space. The problem is rockets don't launch enough for them to be really economically feasible unless they eat up the entire market, which I don't support, by the way. So that's the real problem. Pineapple asks, uh, as asking about if Corellia had lived, uh, would N1 work? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I've heard stuff that suggests Corellia wasn't as great as everyone thought, or if N1 would have worked. I'd have to brush up on my Soviet space history and knowledge of Soviet space technology to answer this, but I don't know. And then using a rudimentary annular aerospike engine would have been out of its time. That's yeah, sure. I think aerospikes were worked on in the 60s in the United States as well. Again, I'd have to brush up on my space technology history. I've, I've been doing market analysis for Starship, so that's on my head. Uh, could have made the design work. Again, don't know. I, I'd have to brush up. Tommy Gasa, I'm assuming that's Japanese characters, asks, space-based solar power plants, uh, yay or nay? Long-term, sure. Short-term, nay. 
you gotta remember these things weigh 60,000 metric tons. We do not have the launch or industrial capacity to make those. And I think we should focus more on more down to earth power options like nuclear that would improve in the short term. But you know, a thousand years from now, we could probably get all of our solar power from space, who knows? Also, read some of the launch vehicle design studies to launch parts of SPS. Those are some big rockets. Shane Boardwell asks, is there any launch vehicle or spacecraft currently in development that you're excited for? I'm looking forward to Vulcan Centaur, personally. Definitely Vulcan Centaur, that's gonna be a neat one to see. Uh, Inner Orbital, originally was gonna be my answer because they, because Neptune was just Outrag, but then they changed their design to LOX Propane Pressure Fed Classic BDB. So that's kind of interesting too, but uh, Thai Space, they're a rocket company in Taiwan, and Gilmore are very interesting because they're developing hybrid launch vehicles. So I want to see those uh, come to, you know, service soon. Those will be really interesting. I don't think anyone's building any pressure-fed launchers, so not except for inner orbital. so I don't know. And spacecraft, uh, I'm really excited about those asteroid missions. Uh, Lucy, Dart will be interesting. There's one more. Uh, yeah. Bo Sorjati asks, your suit jacket seems at least one size too large for you. Did you lose weight or your patience in buying it? I have a confession to make. When I started making YouTube videos, I was rather thin. I'd lost a lot of weight when I moved down here. I weighed about 160 pounds when I made my first video. I weigh 200 pounds now. You watched me get fat again. So yeah, it's, it, they fit nicely. It's a bit, you know, doing this is a bit hard because I got fat again, but that's about right, I think. Sally asks, do you think there's a chance that China will land humans on the moon earlier than the Americans in this century? Uh, no, uh, our lunar plans are, I think, earliest we can do is 2026. So by the end of this decade, unless something goes horribly wrong with SLS or SpaceX bungles Starship somehow, we'll be seeing humans on the moon again by the end of this decade. So unless China has something they've been hiding for the last few years for their development program, I don't think they'll be able to do it till at least 2030 to mid 2035 ish. So probably not. I'd have to do more analysis again. Again, I've been reading about market, the market. So, so Hal Nordman asks three questions. Why is NASA so much into the commercial market? Is it because we're Americans? And then what could we do in the future? And you know, how do you see this developing? So, why commercial market? Yes, we are Americans. We have this weird idea about uh, private industry being intrinsically better. I don't necessarily agree with that. A lot of folks won't necessarily agree with that, but there's plenty of folks who do. Uh, if you've noticed, at least on social media and historically, there's been a lot of libertarians who like space and space travel. So there's a bunch of that, right? The private, the private rocket man, you know, destination moon, that sort of thing. So like Robert Heinlein, Jerry Purnell, wrote science fiction that influenced these people's minds. I think Gary Hudson's a libertarian too. You'll find a lot of them. It's just, there's an American thing. Then why NASA would be pushing into this? You also have to remember it's a public space program. So the presidential administrations and you know the public nominally have influence on these ideas and the public believes that private's better than public. So it influences, it bleeds in there. And I think NASA is interested in seeing how this would develop and fostering this development. Cause that's the other thing they do. They do help foster development. And if there's a new commercial space transport market, they'll be interested in helping make that work, especially if it's lower cost for them, like Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon, which is nominally lower cost, I think. Don't, don't quote me, don't ask. Uh, so yeah, I agree with stuff like Crew Transport, the ISS. I don't necessarily agree with landers or the new spacesuits. I think NASA should have gone with, put something on SLS. We've got plenty of them by the time we're to land, especially the spacesuits. Why? That should have just been, they were, I thought they were almost done. I have to dig into this. Again, these are off the cuff answers, by the way. Uh, so how do I see these other national space agencies developing in the future? What could they do? Uh, more public private partnerships, especially in low earth orbit, since I think that's, there's four being proposed for four uh, space stations now that are commercial. So NASA would definitely be interested in that. I'd like to see how those play out too, just for the, you know, see if that actually works. Uh, and then from the science and research side, I'd like to see more small missions to the moon, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, asteroids, the rest of the solar system. There's a lot of solar system I want to see before I die. So I want, you know, NASA do more of those. So that sort of thing. Yeah, foster more public-private partnerships, I think. And then Bruno Miranda asks, 
Question, are you part of the common sense skeptic uh, team? No, I'm not, uh, they're Canadians. And you can see our, we have a different approach to things. I mean, if they want me to appear in another video, all they have to do is ask, so. Ujal Mehdi asks, one dislike, who did that? My one dedicated hate follower that I know about. Uh, yeah, I have one. You'll notice, I noticed this because it gets three hours after I upload, the dislike will appear, so it's a bot. And all I have to say to that person is, dude, get a life. Uh, yeah. And then Earl Pelton says, first. Yeah, you were the first, but not here. And that's it. Uh, again, thank you all for being my 1,280 cool cryogenic subscribers. Uh, if you had a question you asked and I didn't answer it in this, uh, I didn't see it. YouTube probably deleted it. I'm sorry. That's, I don't know how to do that. Uh, you guys ask it in the comments to, the, to the, this one, I guess. I'll answer it. I'll try to do an iambic pentameter. Uh, and then, so a quick update. I'm going to go backwards. So in February, we're going to know your rocket and a live stream for Artemis 1, assuming that happens in February, and I'm not working when it launches. There will be another know your rocket in January with another live stream, probably around Martin Luther King Jr. Day that weekend, so probably mid-January. And then on December 22nd, assuming nothing goes wrong with my editing, filming, or script writing, you'll be getting Criticizing Starship Part 3, which will be an hour and 15 minutes long with my, at my current estimation. I hope it's shorter, of course, but the script is 26 pages long and I'm not done. So, so yes. See you on December 22nd.